So, um, quickly about the um, abstract, I'll go back real quick. Um, we're going to talk today about the adoption of IEC 61508 and 61511. We're going to talk about functional safety standards, the safety life cycle, key documentation, and information that is supplied to the end users. A little bit about me, I graduated from Virginia Tech with, um, in mechanical engineering, and I have over five years of experience in custom design, manufacturing, and safety engineering. I currently now work for Exeter as a safety engineer, focusing on the mechanical aspect of customers, um, along with doing safety engineering here. I'm also doing research and creating a database for the 2H initiative. A little bit about who Exida is. We were founded in 1999, and now we have offices all around the world. So any country or region that you need Exida in, we are there and we'll be there for you. We have four major um, industry focuses. OEM, system design, end user, and engineering contracting, which would be our trainings and our professional endorsement and education program. Our main products and services are consulting, where we consult in IEC 61511, IEC 62061, and ISO 26262 alarm management, and control system security. We have a bunch of different engineering tools, which we'll talk a little bit later on. We have product certification and functional safety, 61508, control system cybersecurity, and network robustness. We have training in process safety, control system security, um, security development, and alarm management. Um, we can come to you. You can come to us. It doesn't matter how you want to be trained. We can accommodate it. We have our reference materials in databases, textbooks, reference books, market studies, a lot of different um, ways you can get your information. And we have our professional certification programs, our certified functional safety expert and certified functional safety professional. The products that we have currently are the software FACTS, which is Process Hazard Analysis and Hazard Process Analysis Hazard and Operability Studies. We have our Excellentia, Sill Verification, Sill Selection, SRS, and Proof Test Generator. We have our Safety Equipment Reliability Handbook and Database. We have SIL Alarm, which is our alarm rationalization and master alarm database. And we have SILSTAT, one of our newest softwares. And SILSTAT is a field data collection um, tool. It creates and maintains a field failure event database for you. It uses Exodus predictive analysis, and also the reports are compatible with PERD. A reference material, we'd like to brag and let you know that um, Exida is, has authored most of the industry references for automation, safety, and reliability. We have our handbook on equipment failure data, and we've also authored the most comprehensive book on functional safety on the market. So the topics we're going to talk about today are functional safety standards, what are you and what are your customers doing, critical issues, the importance of data integrity, product certification, and roles and responsibilities. So starting with functional safety standards, we're going to break this topic down into, because it is so large, what is functional safety, the scope of 61508, how it applies to mechanical devices, and what does the standard address, the safety life cycle, systematic faults, and random faults. So, IEC 61508. 
defines functional safety as the automatic safety function will perform the intended function correctly or the system will fail in a safe or predictable manner. Working groups and national standard body from around the globe have been involved in the process of bringing together the IEC 61508 standard. IEC 61508 applies to automatic protective systems, the EEPE systems. Um, it provides measures of protection against random hardware failures and systematic design failures. It can be applied to project level work, such as a turnkey system, and product level work, such as off-the-shelf applications. IEC 61508 targets suppliers. Its requirements for suppliers of process control instrumentation for component, element, or subsystem safety. Um, end users should seek suppliers with products certified to this standard by a reputable certifying agency. Basic safety standard. It is the basic safety standard upon the other, which upon the other functional safety standards were developed. Anyone making a safety related EEPE, which is electrical, electronic, or programmable products for the use by others or OEMs should follow the standard. It is Four normative parts plus three guideline parts when you break apart the standard. It defines the concept of SIL and safety life cycle. Um, and the certification portion in 61508 is optional, but the assessment against the requirements of 61508 is not optional. It's mandatory. And a third party certification is highly valued by um, end users and everybody viewing this certificate. It's not enough anymore just to self-certify. IEC 61508 started as a non-governmental industry standard but has grown steadily in its use and, and enforcement. Currently, its level of use and application is so prevalent that it can be Perlius for an organization to ignore the standards recommendations. As most societies become more and more risk averse, compliance with 61508 is becoming all but mandatory in most parts of the industrialized world. In some countries, the standard has even been accepted by the government at by force of law. In most situations, though, the standard is typically cited as best end practice or common engineering practices. And it is often required by your customers when project contracts are drawn up. And when an accident does happen, the standard can be cited civilly in civil cases as common accepted standard of performance. So, as I described, IEC 61508 states that it is written for EEPE-based system. So, the E electrical, E electronic, and P programmable electronics is what it states it's written for. So, I get asked often, does this mean it doesn't, it's not for mechanical problem, products? And um, that is further than the, from the truth than I can even imagine. What I normally tell people is just Google it if you want to find out. When you Google it, one of the first links is the IEC um, Frequently Asked Questions link. If you click on that, you can see it's question number four. So 
it obviously gets asked a lot about if it's just for um, electrical or if it's for mechanical projects as well. And looking at what the standard says exactly is that safety critical mechanical device must be included. It says that if you are a low complexity or a simple mechanical device, you might not be able to comply with every single portion of the standard, but the portions involving mechanical aspects you do need to comply to. So we're going to look at the standards. Um, IEC 61508 is commonly referred to as the umbrella standard. It applies for all industries, and it applies to um, suppliers mostly. And 61508 was broken up into multiple segments to be more detailed. First of all, you have the nuclear section, 61513. Then you have the machinery se sector, 62061. And finally, you have the process injury street sector, 61511, which we're going to dive into more today. So if you want to look at what end users or what your customers are doing, they're using IEC 61511. Why is there a need? We're going to look at safety instrumented systems, SIFs. We're going to look at safety instrumented functions, SIFs, and the safety life cycle. So 61.511 states or standard targets end users, engineering contractors, and integrators in the process industry. It covers the entire safety instrumented system life cycle. It shows risk analysis, performance-based design, and operations and maintenance. It is a performance, not prescriptive standard. So it doesn't give you exactly how you need to do this. It just wants the end result. And it is an end-user application. It's independent functional safety assessments. Um, the IEC 61511 is broken down into three sections. The first section are the requirements. The middle sections are the guideline. The end is in fill selection. Since it is a user-focused standard, it does not assign responsibility. These responsibilities must still be done for any given project in the safety manual or the FSM plan, but it does not tell you exactly what you need to do and the way you need to do it. There are no detailed requirements for embedded software or high-level languages like C or C++, and it tells you to refer back to 61508 for those details. And it uses the same safety life cycle and the SIL concepts as 61508, but it uses it in more of a process industry language. So why is there a need? We're going to start with explaining what a safety instrument and system is in its definition. 61.511 defines a safety instrumented system as an instrumented system used to implement one or more safety instrumented functions. A SIS is comprised of a co any combinations of sensors, logic solvers, and final elements. There are no restrictions as to what type of technology is used or the size of the system. A SIS could comprise of one single function, but often a SIS has anything from a handful to several hundred functions, depending on the application. But often, everybody says, yeah, that definition's great, but what does it really mean? So we took that and made um, a more functional definition. So, a SIS is, is defined as a system com 
composed of sensors, logic solvers, and final elements designed for the purpose of A, automatically taking an industrial process to a safe state when specific conditions are violated, B, permitting a process to move forward in a safe manner when the specific conditions allow, or C, taking action to mitigate the consequences of an industrial hazard. A CIS is much like a basic process control system, such as one shown here, in that both have sensors, logic solvers, and final elements. However, a CIS operates in a completely different mode and has a unique design, maintenance, and or mechanical integrity requirements. Now, we're going to look at what a CIS is. A CIS is a safety instrument and function. It is a safety function with a specific SIL, which is ne necessary to achieve the functional safety and which can be either a safety instrumented protection function or a safety instrumented control function. Only a SIF can have a SIL assigned. We do not assign SILs to other safety devices such as a relief valve or a check valve. A protection function assumes that the frequency of demand on the SIF is low such as once a year or even less, less frequent, which is typically in many process applications. If there is a continuous function, such as high demand application, then it is called a control function. So now we're going to look at a couple examples of um, some SIFs. So the first example, on detecting a high temperature, prevent column rupture by set, shutting off steam flow to the recoiler. That would be considered a SIF. On detecting high pressure, it prevents tank rupture by opening a valve to release the system. On detecting a high level, it opens a drain valve to direct excess liquid to waste some to reduce environmental damage. On detecting a fire, it issues alarms to minimize damage and possible injury. But note that a SIF must include elements of detection, decision, and action to achieve or maintain a safe or mitigated state. So this last example could be part of the SIF, but it is not a full SIF since it did not achieve a safe state. It needed a final action to be included. Now we can take a look at what is a SIL. A SIL is a safety integrity level. IEC 61511 only defines SIL 1 through 3, and it has an as it is expected that SIL 3 would be a maximum level in a process sector, excepting nuclear. For SIL 4 requirements, IEC 61511 refers you back to IEC 61508. Um, this is the graph from 61508 and 511, showing the SIL, SIL 1 through 4 as one being the lowest and four having the highest safety integrity level. This is the safety life cycle according to IEC 61511. It's broken up into three main parts, the analysis, the design, and the operation phases. We're going to take a look in more in detail in these three parts separately. When you put the safety life cycle into place, you can refer to it as almost a bridge to safety. When you have each section, you have the supports and the cables, it will safely get you from one end 
to the other. But if you do not have all the tables and all the supports in place, you will have a weakened bridge. So you can do 99% of um, a safety life cycle complete and a very good job. But if you have one or two cables or supports missing, the whole thing can end up in a bad position. We're going to first look at the analysis phase. In a safety instrumented system designed to automatically protect in an industrial process, the steps required to do this cannot begin until the conceptual design of the process is complete. At that point, the process is examined for potential hazards. The risk of each hazard is assessed by estimating the likelihood or frequency of occurrence and consequence magnitude if it does occur. For those risks that need to be reduced, the safety requirements are created. Often, the need for a safety can be achieved without a safety instrumented system. For those places where a safety instrumented system is judged to be the best solution, a risk reduction target is defined with a safety instrumented level, or a SIL. It is a description of the needed safety function, along with all important information, including the SIL, is documented in a safety requirement specification, or the SRS, which is at the bottom right-hand corner. So you look at, you go through every phases, and you, the outcome is put together for your SRS. So what is a safety recommended requirement specification or your SRS? The objective is to specify the required risk reduction or difference between existing and tolerable risk levels in terms of a SIL. The tasks are compare the process risk against the tolerable risk, use the decision guidelines to select the required risk risk reduction, and document the selection process. The hazard identification and risk analysis process accumulates in a document called the SRS. For all safety instrumented functions defined, a certain information must be specific. It should include specific conditions sensed, the actions to be taken, the timing, timing the maintenance, and bypass requirements, as well as any known special requirements needed to properly reduce the risk. Next, we'll take a look at the design phase. The relation phase begins with a conceptual design, and the safety instrumented system is based on the safety requirement specification. The desired technology is chosen for sensors, logic solvers, and or final elements. Once the technology is chosen, often redundant device configuration or architectures are selected based on experience in the safety instrumented system design. There are several different architectures that can be used depending on the performance of an individual component and the need of the system. They have commonly have names like one out of one, one out of two, two out of three, or even one out of two D when the D stands for diagnostics. The term two out of three, let's say, means that there are three elements are present, and two of those devices must indicate a trip in order for that trip to be signaled. Next, we'll look at the operation and maintenance phase. The operation and maintenance phase of the life cycle begins with the validation of the design. This validation must answer the following questions. Does the system solve the problems identified during the hazard analysis? Have all necess necessary design steps been carried out successfully? 
as the design met the targeted sill for each safety instrumented function, have the maintenance procedures been created and verified? Is there a management of change procedure in place? Are operations and maintenance personnel qualified and trained? And these answers to all of these questions must be acceptable before proceeding into a startup and operation phase. So next we're going to take a look at some critical issues that come up. We're going to look at defining the user project requirements, SIL verification, proven in use, or the IEC 61508 for all equipment, and requirements for management. So the first one was to find user projects requirement, and you must define them well. We're going to look at the safety life cycle, the strength against random failures, and the strength against systematic failures. Tools such as simplified equations, fault trees, or Markov models are used to calculate the system if the system achieves its required SIL using data obtained from various sources. Failure rate databases that are products and applications specific are best. In some cases, manufacturers' failure data is a good source of failure data. The end result of the analysis is a set of reliability and safety metrics that are used to verify that the requirements have been met. So once you decide if they have been met, you want to select your technology. The objective is to choose the right equipment for the purpose. All criteria used for process control still apply. The tasks are choose the equipment, obtain reliability and safety data for the equipment, and obtain a safety manual for any safety certified equipment or equipment making still capability claim. So the conceptual design begins with identifying the identification of the equipment to be used in the SIS. The criteria used to select the equipment for process controls, such as materials, accuracy, environmental condition, conditions, so on, also comply for safety applica um, applications. In addition, failure rate data should be available to assist in the design. For equipment certified to a particular skill level, always maintain the equipment's safety manual. That manual includes essential information for proper application of the equipment. For equipment not safety certified, the user is responsible for proper application. So in that, we're going to look at the equipment selection. IEC 61511 requires that equipment use in safety instrumented systems be chosen based on either IEC 61508 assessment, the second and third part, to the appropriate SIL level or justification based on prior use. You also have to look at SIL architecture. You have to Choose the type of redundancy if there is one needed. Often the designer will specify a redundant architecture to achieve a higher level of safety or equipment availability. Different redundant architectures can achieve fault tolerances against different failure modes. A detailed understanding of redundant architectures is um, available in other webinars that we have. Uh, um, already recorded on our website and our YouTube channel station, along with some blogs written on it. If you do want more information, I can help you get that. You also have to establish um, proof test frequency and their options. In, if testing is automatically performed by safety equipment, the test interval is determined 
by the manufacturer or when the equipment is set up. Normally, for online automatic testing, this interval is short on the order of seconds or even minutes. Otherwise, for more involved offline testing, the requirement is normally to provide a periodic proof test during the time during turnaround. In that case, the time between turnaround shutdowns is the targeted proof. look at the effect of incomplete testing. If the testing is not done effectively, some hidden dangerous failures are not detected. The result of this is that the PFD average is higher during the life of the equipment. If we take a look at this graph, you can see the importance of your test effectiveness. So the more effective the test results, a lower PFD average and a higher risk reduction is available. So if you take a look, you might have designed your system around a SIL-3 device. But if your test effectiveness isn't the greatest, it does not return back to zero and it steadily climbs. And after just a few test periods, you are now at a SIL-2 level and while you think you're running at a SIL-3. And if you continue this process, you could even be at a SIL-1, which is extremely dangerous, assuming that you have a SIL-3 process. So now we're going to look at compliance requirements. If you have SIL capability, which is the process, we look at your documentation, all of your process, you have the top circle. You look at the probability of failure and your um, FAMIDA and dangerous failure results numbers. So you are covered on your right side. You look at your architectural constraints. You're covered on your left. But only if you meet all of three of those are in actual compliance. So we're going to look at the importance of data integrity, why it matters, some comparison of data sources, the impact of too good to be true data, product stewardship, and legal responsibility. And once again, you can see our bridge to safety. This time, it wasn't the greatest of designs. It was actually, the design was fine, but you were given optimistic data that leads to your unsafe design. So you might have been given insufficient redundancy or ins insufficient testing, and therefore your reduced risk reduction will not be reached. And like I said before, if you have certain columns or certain cables that are not supporting this bridge anymore, it is not a bridge to safety. I don't want to be on that bridge. So we're going to look at what is bad. What is bad data? The Webster's Dictionary defines bad as failing to reach the appropriate standard or poor, such as a bad repair job. Exeter goes a little bit further and defines bad data as a data that leads to unrealistic and often dangerous designs. So, as you may have guessed, risk varies with use. If you, in your marketing brochure, saying, hey, we make very high quality stuff, it never ever fails, we're the best. The risk is low. Your reputation might be damaged from exaggerating claims, but that risk isn't going to endanger lives. On the other hand, if you use it in safety reliability calculations, say, look, the math shows you don't need any redundancy, it's a one out of one architecture, and there is never the need to test the function. You don't have to do proof testing, you're great, just put it in and go. The risk is very high. There's potential loss of life due to underdesigned safety functions. So when you're going to use 
numbers. Consider where this data came from. Consider if it might be exaggerated and the what is your consequence of using bad data. So what are some companies missing? One of the premise of IEC 61508 and IEC 61511 is that the automated protection systems with diagnostics and periodic testing can provide higher safety reliability than typical control functions. The standards outline the steps that must take to place a claim to higher safety reliability. However, these steps are only valid if appropriate or good data is used. Now we're going to take a look at failure rate data and give you three examples, or a few more than that, but give you examples of um, where failure rate data can come from. You have industry data banks, which are not application specific and not product specific. You have manufacturers, FMEDA, or a field failure study which are product specific, but not application specific, and detailed field failure study application model, which is product specific and application specific. So of course, you immediately, your eye goes to this chart and says, I want product and application specific. But a lot of that um, might, that doesn't exist. There's not many, there's currently no real detailed field failure studies breaking it down into product and application for everything that your system may occur. So let's look at some realistic ones. We're going to look into field failure study. The field failure studies with sufficient information represent a rich opportunity to obtain failure rate information about a specific application. The problem, however, is ins insufficient information. However, even just limited information is really useful. You just have to um, be careful sometimes because you might get the manufacturer warranty studies and a lot of the times a uh, warrant or device will be returned and it will be not counted as a failure as customer misuse or um, a lot of not counted failures. That actually might be a real failure. So if you're using a field failure study, you have to be very careful while looking at those. The next um, field failure model we're going to look at is FAMITAS. And a FAMITA is a predictive failure rate and failure mode model for some components. And it can be constructed as a tiered set of FAMITAs. The component database is the source for this data. So you take your bill of material and you break it down into per part. And you figure out all of the ways this part can break. You're taking in consideration the environment, the application, and all of that when you're looking at this. And you are, the result is your specific product failure rate, your product failure mode, and your diagnostic coverage. And the great thing about Pamita is they're actual validated results. We take the product failure rate and compare it to proven and use studies. This is performed for all assessments. And as you can see here in this example, the FAMITA comes in at 88 fits is a failure in time, and the proven and use study is 57 fits or failures in time, which is great because you always want your FAMITA to be slightly conservative because you don't want to be the company that has more failures than predicted. Now we're going to quickly go over some product certification and what it entails and um, how this can help you.
So product certification involves the 61508 life cycle, the analysis phase, the realization phase, and the operation phase. It, the, a key objective of IEC 61508 is to address accidents caused by creating a system to manage safely, safety, to assure proper technical requirements, and to assure competent personnel. So users will require certification bodies to use IEC 61508 to clarify, certify equipment per technical requirements processes such as functional safety management and personnel. Um, so breaking it into two parts, you have um, the safety life cycle detail engineering process, which is design reliability, or the systematic faults or design mistakes. You also have the probability, probabilistic performance-based design, or the hardware reliability. Also, the random failures. And in IEC 61508, there's, of course, certification milestones. You have your hardware should meet the PFD average expectations for a still via low failure rates, fail-safe design, high diagnostic coverage. It needs another milestone is the hardware must meet the safe failure fraction for a recommended target, which is Route 1H, and introduced in 2010 is the Route 2H, which is a more proven and used design for simple mechanical devices, which would not be able to meet the diagnostics requirements for the safe failure fraction. Another milestone in software is to meet the software process requirement for target cell systematic fault avoidance, for the product is to meet design process requirements for the targeted still as systematic fault avoidance and produce a safety manual for your user. So what does it mean for product development? There's a needed a documented safety life cycle. There's a need for requirements, needed requirements for safety related functions. You need a safety-related validation plan. You need a defined architecture, like we said, a one out of one, one out of two, so on. You need a qualified set of tools, including language compiler fit for the purpose. You need a coding standard and documented descriptions of other means utilized to qualify the set of tools. You need to find a follow a coding standard, and you need to verify compliance to coding standards, design requirements, and other means. As we discussed before, not um, all of these requirements need to be met for simple mechanical device, but the ones that do still need to be met. So what does a full certification and a certificate look like? This is one of our um, examples we give. The end result of a full certification process is a process certificate and an assessment report. The certificate lists the cell level for which the product was qualified. However, it must be understood that products can receive for full certifications with restrictions. So look for that. Those will be listed in the safety manual. On the back of the certificate, on our certificate, it, we list the dangerous and the safe failure rates. Look for both dangerous and safe failures on your certificates. With that, you don't want something that has an okay dangerous, but you have safe failures through the roof. That's going to result in so many spurious trips. Your plant is going to be shut down. You're going to have a number of time, time wasted, so much money wasted, and that's not what you want to have. So look for both your safe failure number and your dangerous failure number. These are typical um, document checklists that we go through when we look at your um, project. We will look at your safety manual. We'll look at validation and verification results and plans. We're going to look at training procedures and how you make modifications. So 
if you're a company that is already doing all of this stuff, an assessment can go by quite painlessly. We take all of those documents and put them into our tool called the safety case. So we take each piece of um, evidence that we collect or your documents and put them for each argument that the standard makes and justify that by the requirements. So if we see that you might be missing one or two pieces of information, we'll send you out um, a to-do list or an audit list or a gap report. And we send out those those to you so you can clean up anywhere so you make sure that you are fully 61508 compliant. And at the end of that is when you receive your certification, your certificate, and your assessment report. And that is all I have for you today. Um, if you have any questions, you can always email me at any time. And um, like I said, I'm going to, I had a bunch of questions in the morning um, the morning class, so I will make sure to answer all of those questions and send them out to you. And if um, you have any questions, you can type it in real quick right now, and if not, or if you think of them later, just email me anytime and I'll get back to you as soon as possible. Um, I don't have one question. Isn't there a review of 61511 underway at the moment? Yes, there is. 